Don't be waiting for the rest of the day. Get started off. Yeah, I'll, I'll wait a minute. Go ahead. I'll get this. This uh, afternoon, by uh, first of all, I've been introduced, so I don't have to do that. But I'd like to tell you exactly what some of this, uh, what you're going to be hearing, are really part of several different lectures. In fact, we have a series of six, and uh, one is on Eastern and Western music and comparisons of the two. One is on Armenian instruments, which is uh, the bulk of the talk I'll be giving today, and uh, one is on dance. You will see part of that. And we're also going to have a live dancer here, I guess. One is on Armenian song, and one is on classical music. Now, Armenian classical music. Uh, we'll be talking quite a bit about instruments, because I have some to show you here, except, unfortunately, I don't have them all. Usually, when I do the instrument lecture, I usually have about five musicians with me who play the different instruments. Uh, but we understand the budget is too small for such a thing, so uh, it's really not a matter of just the budget, but it's a time element. It's very hard to get anyone to come during the day because usually most of them work. Uh, but I'm going to give you just a little bit of everything today. And if you have any questions, well, I make this very informal because it's not a, uh, I don't picture this as being too much of a formal lecture. So ask me questions as we go along. And let's talk a little bit, a little bit about Eastern and Western music. One of the big prime uh, beefs that I have, that I've been working on, and uh, Many people, of course, have been uh, also concerned with this, is the acceptance of Eastern music by Western countries. Uh, in the last 40 years, probably, there's been more acceptance, especially in the last 20, 25 years, uh, due to the efforts of certain composers and because of lines of communication. I mean, people are traveling to the East. Uh, there's more of an ethnic awareness in the country, especially in the United States today. A lot, uh, can we close the door? I think it's kind of distracting. But uh, I don't see Eastern, uh, aside from political and socioeconomic lines, I mean, uh, I don't see Eastern and Western music really being separate that much as being part of a uh, the face, two different faces of the same coin. And most of this has been borne out by the music that's been uh, played and written by such men as Kachaturian, you probably know him as being the most famous Armenian composer. But there are quite a few other ones, the Russian composers, Georgian composers. Uh, you've heard of the great choreographer Balanchine. Well, he has a, a brother in Georgia whose name is Balanchevadze, who is one of the great composers of Georgia. Mm -hmm. uh, did you know that? No. One of the, uh, he is one of the greatest, I guess, choreographers in the world today, George Balanchine, who teaches at Juilliard. And uh, there's quite a bit going on with interaction between musicians and music. But one of the prime problems that's always been with music and acceptance of one over the other is really conditioning. Now, for most of us, uh, myself, I'm going to have to pull myself out of this and a lot of the Armenian teachers. How many Armenian teachers do we have? Well, uh, Armenian American people who have been exposed to both cultures kind of uh, don't fit particularly into any one of the categories, they fit into both categories. Because we've been uh, nurtured on one culture and then we've come to this country and we've learned to accept and develop in another culture. But uh, Western culture, for instance, for the most part has been weaned on and uh, conditioned for the past 300 years since the time of Bach, for instance on this seven scale diatonic uh, scale, seven step diatonic scale, which as you know, you're all familiar with it. Now, mostly all of the music that you hear for the past 300 years fits into, or is made up of, basically these seven notes. It's a combination of these notes, a variation of these notes, but basically it is made up of these seven notes. Uh, and 
whether you know it or not, for these past 300 years, you've been conditioned continuously to hearing uh, exactly uh, these seven notes in different proportions, but you always hear them, whether you hear them directly or indirectly, you always hear them in one unit. Now, psychologically, it's been having a great effect. Music, we know it has a great psychological effect in many different ways. It can change your heart rate, it's been proven. You can uh, sweat, you can laugh, you can cry, you can do anything, and depending on how the music is played and how it's perceived. Uh, let me show you a different example, uh, a basic example of uh, psychology and music. If you take any basic note, for instance, let's take this particular note. This note happens to be a B. And does this note mean anything to most of you? Does it do anything for you? If I just play it? <laughs> That's annoying. Does it do anything basically for it? Does it want you to, does it make you want to do anything? No. Okay, now, if we take this particular note and we put it in sequence with a group of other notes, something extraordinary happens. And listen to it. See, by itself, it's totally meaningless. It's just a note out in the clear blue sky. But any note can be put into this situation. And it's a very, very strong urge to finish that scale. And that urge, this little half step, which is called the leading tone, has been one of the prime, dominant psychological factors in Western music. Now, if you imagine sitting and listening to a concert and the pianist is playing, let's say, uh, and he walks off. <laughs> you want to drag him back? And do what? Yeah. Well, so you see, just by arrangement and conditioning of all over, over these past 300 years, what's happened? You've been conditioned to hear that and you want to hear it. There's no way out of this thing. Now we're in uh, contemporary music, of course, we're trying to move out of this, right, to out of key centers, out of this type of entrapment. Now, Eastern music has also has the same effect. Now, they're just as liable for all these things. When you listen to Eastern music, without this particular interval, which is technically called the augmented second, uh, you have the same problems. For instance, if you listen to this. just as much to this augmented second, for instance, as uh, Westerners are conditioned to the leading tone, which finishes the diatonic scale. These uh, particular things uh, have an enormous effect as to why a lot of the music has not been accepted by the West and East, because they are, this is how they're different. They are conditioned to the point where you must be reconditioned to be able to accept a lot of these things. To many people, some of these uh, augmented second, for instance, if you've studied harmony, have any of you had music courses before? You must have come across when you study harmony that the augmented second is never to be written. If you look at Bach's music, in none of his music, in any of his music, will you ever find that interval? That was forbidden completely. <coughs> it was forbidden because, first of all, the reason it was given that it was very difficult to sing. Well, I know it's not very difficult to sing. We have a singer here that sings it all the time. Now, it cannot be difficult to sing, but for someone, at some point in history, it was difficult to sing, and it was conditioned in this way, and so forth, and continued in that direction. Today, we're trying to get away from these type of things. But music still has an enormous psychological bearing on everyone in every way. Harmony, rhythm, all these things contribute to a very basic psychological uh, development of you, of, uh, of life itself, you see. So 
So, harmony in itself, for instance, is uh, the grammar of music. You know, let me let me give you a little example of how harmony might function. If you take a uh, a note. melody on one note like this, and you harmonize them in several different ways, you're going to get several different characterizations out of it. For instance, or if you put it in a minor, same melody, but it makes it sound quite different. You can make it sound even jazzy if you wish. But harmony does these things. So music plays a great deal psychologically on, on, on us in our daily lives. This is one of the problems. Now, in one of our lectures, we cover this thing from point to point. I'm trying to skip around to get to it. But I'm going to, uh, if there's any questions, no questions on that particular part of it, I'm going to jump over to instruments because we only have a certain amount of time to go across. Armenian instruments are basically three types. Woodwinds, strings, and percussion. We have no brass instruments. Uh, they use brass instruments today, modern brass instruments, but folk instruments are basically woodwinds, percussion, and strings. I'm going to start out with the woodwinds and show you the three different types. This particular woodwind instrument is the predecessor of the oboe. And if you can see here, it's a conical shaped instrument, which means that as you go higher, it gets softer. As you go lower, it has the uh, tendency to get much louder. And uh, it has a double reed, which I'll show you here in just a second. On a metal base, very small reed, that is put on here in play. Now, those of you, you must have all seen something similar to this. What does modern instrument resemble? No, the oboe. The oboe is the only one that has a double reed like this with uh, in a conical shape and also has a very interesting tuning device which is this little peg here and it goes inside here as the uh, what we do is you wet this so that the wood expands and you press it in here and if it's flat why uh, you press it in further and if it's sharp you pull it out a little bit so you are able to tool, tune this instrument it's a very ancient instrument it's called a zurna for uh, And uh, it's a very difficult instrument to play. First of all, it takes an enormous amount of time to get the reed ready to play. And it is an extraordinarily loud instrument. Uh, I don't play this particular instrument yet, but uh, these are usually played in pairs. And two of these were played at the Shrine Auditorium. And most of you know how massive that place is, without microphones. And you could hear it just like you were from the back. You could hear it just as well as you were standing right there at the stage. Enormously loud instrument, usually played in the outside. I doubt very much it's played in the inside of a house, but uh, they're used on concert stages quite a bit. Uh, more primitive dances are played on this rather than the uh, more sophisticated uh, folk dances. But it is a very interesting instrument in that also it does cover two octaves. Now, uh, some of you, those of you who know about music, you know what an octave is, it's eight notes. This can go up to 16 notes. And it's done through the process of overtone playing. Uh, I don't, don't want to go into that now, but it does cover two octaves, and it's a very unique type of instrument. The more basic instrument, and probably the first one, is this flute-type instrument, which uh, we call a tutak. or a schmidt. I don't know if you exactly want to, which way to spell it, but I'm sure that's about as close as we can come to it. It's an interesting instrument. They come in several different sizes, so you can play it in different keys. They come about five, six, seven different sizes. If you see different musicians playing them, uh, when they have to, for instance, accompany a singer, they have several of them there, so whatever key she's going to be singing in, they pick out that particular instrument and play it. That way they don't have to transpose. Uh, this is a little bit more advanced one than this. This is a much more primitive one. You can 
kind of pass it around and take a look. This is made out of bamboo, and this is made out of hardwood. And it has a little tuning fork, a tuning device up here, which is, uh, by pushing it up and down, you can get, oh, maybe about a quarter tone. I tried to tune it to this piano here, uh, slightly off still on it, but it can give you almost three octaves on this. Uh, I'm going to show you what I'm, this is the lower range. Mid range and the upper. You can only get about four or five notes up at the top there. But it's quite a versatile instrument. See. Mostly, you know that we have, for instance, clarinets, modern clarinets, and other instruments, and we need quite a bunch of keys on there to get all this. Most of the uh, notes that are played in his flats and sharps and everything are half hold. In other words, instead of playing one. Here, three notes, all with one finger. I'm going to play you a little bit of this. I brought along my own accompaniment. In fact, I just did it right before you came. So I accompanied myself on the piano a little bit. I hope you'll be able to hear it. Usually we have the musicians play along with this, so it sounds quite different. On it. So that is the tuta or the shvi. Then we have the most popular Armenian woodwind instrument, and that's called a duduk. D u d u k. Ah. Uh, It's made out of rosewood, usually, or hard walnut, and uh, it's tuned on a mixolydian scale, uh, which is a, uh, we have several different types of scales that are used in Armenian music. This particular one is tuned to that, and it uses a bamboo uh, mouthpiece. Now this is one solid piece, Oops. which has been shaped down into the shape that it's in. It's not two pieces stuck together. It's one solid piece. It's been shaped down to this uh, shape. And then it's carved and shaped and shaped for, oh, weeks at a time. Then it's played and shaved again, played and shaved again, until they finally get it exactly in tune with what they want. And also has a little fishing line that's usually wound around here. It's wet like this and put in here. Also has a tuning little tuning knob that's fit right on top here and now it's difficult to tune these 
these are usually played in pairs. One person holds a pedal point, which is called a dem. The dem, which is the pedal point, and usually is done very interesting situation because these people are experts in just doing that. Uh, usually in Armenia, the dam cash, which is the person who holds the pedal point, uh, usually is a dam cash for years to a master player. And then he graduates and becomes a master player. Now, the man who holds the pedal point usually holds one to two notes to accompany the soloist. The trick is never to stop playing. And it's done through a process called circular breathing. They fill up the lower cavity while they're blowing out uh, from the upper cavity, and then they uh, suck in air through the nose at the same time and are able to close off the uh, mouth chamber in order to fill up air again. And they keep this going, circular breathing constantly. Uh, I've asked how it's done there, and they showed me. And if you want to try it, you can do it too. Uh, you take a straw and you put it in a glass of water and you're constantly blowing through a very thin stream of air and at the same time as you're blowing in you try to uh, suck in air through your nostrils now if you get water up here you're doing it wrong <laughs> so uh, I haven't quite mastered that yet but they can go on literally for hours holding the same note they have contests there, I heard, that, you know, that they go on for two, three hours to see who can hold on long. And if you take a look at some of these people, they have extraordinary neck muscles, just like almost like uh, our own football players, uh, linebackers, you know, to have these heavy um, uh, neck muscles. And they need that in order to be able to push in and out uh, the diaphragm here, to be able to push the air in and out and be able to uh, constantly fill the chamber. Now, uh, this accompanies the soloist. Now, since I don't have an accompanist with me, I also have an accompaniment on the uh, uh, tape recorder here. Except that uh, occasionally you will hear this stop. That's when I'm taking a breath. So I couldn't... Uh, time when they're playing these things they sit there with it in their mouths like lollipops you know another play. <laughs> so if you excuse me a minute here <laughs>
shepherds play? No, usually the shepherds are playing this one up here. This is the one that you see the most of. Them. <coughs> this uh, comes from the uh, different villages and uh, from Gyumri mostly. It's a village in northern Armenia called Leningrad today. From the, those areas there and northern parts of Armenia down towards Georgia. And uh, it's used now primarily in villages and uh, in concert halls quite a bit. Uh, they're used in pairs and threes and fours and they play total harmony and everything with this. There was a group that came here, which you'll see here, that uh, had a 15-piece uh, group. It was part of a dance group. And uh, they used four of these at one time, so you could hear a full harmony of playing going on. So anyway, um, it is a very delicate instrument, and it's a very expressive instrument, and it takes a long time to learn to play these things. Also, you need to continuously keep pampering the instrument because it's got to be properly wet, it's got to be properly uh, played constantly. If you don't play it for quite a while, the uh, different parts of it begin to, I mean, the mouthpiece begins to stick and it's very difficult to pry it apart after playing it and getting it wet. And it's got to become very supple, and then it opens up and uh, plays much better. But it is a very expressive instrument and you will hear it in the film a little bit uh, the different dances so of how this instrument is played. Now those are the three basic uh, woodwind instruments. The uh, basic percussion instrument that the, we have is this uh, drum here which is called a dahol and it's It's a, uh, it's a cylindrical instrument with two heads, usually sheepskin. Uh, quite a bit of the time, they used to use fish skin on here. The reason they use fish skin is it's not uh, susceptible to weather or heat or cold, but uh, sheepskin is. And it's got to be constantly kept warm, otherwise it loosens down. It has a series of ropes that are put into different patterns here and a rope is stitched all the way across here. By pulling this rope down, you tune the instrument and make it sound higher. By pulling it the opposite direction, it loosens the heads and makes it sound lower. You can get several different types of sounds out of this. They are played either with the full hand and the, and, or the fingers, just the fingers. Uh, by playing on the inside, on either side, you get two different sounds, the bass note and then the treble note, which comes here. You can play it with the fingers. Good experts will do rolls with their fingers and everything else. I'm not a drummer, but just to give you a thing. And it gives you quite a variety of different sounds. We have played, uh, for instance, with the full hand. Let me see. passages with their fingers, otherwise and they usually can twist the drum around without stopping, don't ask me to do it, I can't, by, uh, and get a different sound right here by bringing it up here without stop missing a beat and continuing. Uh, we have a fellow that does that here. He could bring it today, but he's one of the regular parts of the lecture. Uh, the other drum that is used is a more ancient drum, and unfortunately we had an accident with it. There's a piece of skin that goes on here too. Well, I'm going to have to reskin this pretty soon, but this is the one that used to always use fish skin because these are much more susceptible to weather. And uh, of course you can see what this is a predecessor of, the modern tambourine. 
Uh, they come in various different sizes. They come in large sizes to very small sizes like this. And so experts on these can play three or four of them at a time. They toss them around, juggle them, and play them at the same time. Uh, Armenians have used this for oh, quite a time, but I don't think very, that this is indigenous to Armenia itself. I think it's more indigenous to the general area of the Middle East. But you will see pictures and uh, uh, in different books, if you uh, look up some of these things, you'll see that different countries have been uh, using these. For instance, this particular one, which we call the Zurna in Armenian. By the way, uh, Zurna in Armenian, uh, the name of this instrument is also used as a derogatory term for a child who is too noisy, you see, uh, by usually parents, uh, saying that you sound like the Zurna. You see. But there is a Czechoslovakian instrument called the Zurla, which is identical to this one, but much larger. And uh, the names are, of course, very, very much, uh, you know, Coincidentally, they sound almost identical. So uh, I don't particularly think that the uh, uh, Czechoslovakian instrument came first because these instruments have been indigenous to the uh, Armenian region there for much, much a longer period of time. But this drum, although used very extensively by Armenians, uh, I, I personally doubt it is, but uh, I haven't been able to check that out quite well. Uh, the only instrument that we have here today, we have several, of course, uh, string instruments, quite a few, but only one I've been able to bring with me is an instrument called the Hemanchek. I'm show this to you. It's a very old instrument. I, was a, I, do, I have a collection of many of these instruments, and this is one of my pride and joys. I have to have this completely restored. But uh, this belonged to one of the great Armenian uh, players. He died about 20 years ago. I was able to acquire this instrument. I won't even tell you for how much, but if you can see here, it has mother of pearl decoration. It has kind of an onion type belly. And it has a piece of skin that's stretched across the top of the instrument with, and the soundboard that goes right through here. There's a sound peg that goes up here. There's a small bridge which is, acts uh, very much like a violin bridge does on a violin. And you have your fingerboard and your four pegs. The original Kamanchas used to be only three string instruments. The modern day ones in the last 100 years have now four strings. They are tuned in fifths like a violin and played almost, uh, fingered almost the same. Uh, the bow, is going to be changed too, but the bow is usually just a uh, supple piece of wood. And these hair, rather than being attached to a frog at the bottom like a violin bow does, uh, has a piece of leather, which is not this here, a piece of leather which then you are able to uh, control by pulling on the leather back and forth. And you can control the tension of the hair, which then gives you the different sounds that you can get from the uh, violin, I mean from the kamancha, which are very much sound like very wailing type of sound. It's a very beautiful instrument, it's a very thin sounded instrument, but it is an also an extraordinarily expressive instrument. I, too bad we don't have the, again the players to play this here for you, but I just wanted you to see that this is one of the instruments. The other instrument, which looks very much like a zither, which is called a kanon, is uh, uh, an instrument that looks like, you know, I mean, most of you know what a zither looks like, you know, a dulcimer type of thing. Uh, it's a, uh, yeah, many strings to it, but it's not an Armenian instrument. It's, a, it's basically an Egyptian instrument, but you will see it in Armenian orchestras, uh, Armenian folk orchestras all over. And we have a master uh, of that instrument here in Los Angeles. In fact, We've got two of them now. There's one that's recently come here. Uh, one of these days, if you have a chance to see our lecture with the full orchestra and everything where we play all these instruments and demonstrate them, uh, do so so you can get to see and hear some of these uh, instruments. But basically, this is all the instruments that I have brought here. I want you to hear also what 
we do with music that is uh, we take how Armenian folk music I'm going to have to sounds when it's put into occidental terms which means how it sounds with a symphony orchestra now I'm going to is this right to work? I'm going to play you a piece here with two folk tunes on it I will turn this on <laughs> And uh, these are two folk tunes that I orchestrated into a very large, uh, elaborate orchestration. But they are basic Armenian folk tunes. And I want you to hear what they sound like when they're played with a symphony orchestra.
it, uh, you can hear it sounds, well, you didn't hear the original for you to be able to uh, put it together, I mean, compare the two, but uh, quite a bit of this is now being done in Armenia, where folk music is now being very much incorporated into uh, Occidental music, but uh, in Armenia there's also a general movement today that's going towards contemporary music and uh, into avant-garde music and uh, you find composers of, in fact I think per capita Armenia has more composers than any other country I know. We're a small country with maybe a couple hundred composers and uh, they're doing quite a bit of work over there. They're being recognized all over, mostly all over the Soviet Union but some of them are beginning to get quite a bit of recognition outside of the Soviet Union. There's the Aratunian Trumpet Concerto which is now all very, very popular even in the Midwest, here and uh, back East, being played by many of the major orchestras. And it was written back in 1948 and it's just being discovered right now. I'm going to finish off today by showing you a little homemade movie. Uh, this is a movie of the Armenian dance group, which uh, came from, the, uh, from Armenia about six, seven years ago. Were you there? about seven years ago and uh, dance at the Shrine Auditorium. You will see several different types of uh, dances here with different costumes and uh, music. The only problem with this film is a friend of mine took this uh, with his own home camera and it has sound by the way to it. But he just shot sections of each one so you'll be seeing one dance and getting into it and suddenly you're in another one. So you'll have to excuse uh, that part of the techno uh, technology here. But it's still interesting enough to be able to see the film and be able to see the different types of dances that are done. If there are any questions, I'll take them now and then. Yes? Uh, I don't want to sound too because uh, the music, you know, it's kind of the dancing into really dancing also? No. We have, uh, <laughs> see, that's one of the things I've been kind of fighting against. <laughs> Belly dancing. Uh, and things of that nature. First of all, those are not folk, that's not folk dancing. Uh, secondly, it, uh, you go to Armenia, you will never see it. Uh, none of it is done. Uh, it's not indigenous to us at all, you see. But since it's uh, very much prevalent in the Middle East, and of course many, many Armenians live in the Middle East, uh, you know, wherever you live, you assimilate part of that culture. And uh, so, if you go to nightclubs here where it says Armenian nightclub and you see a belly dancer, you quite normally think that that's Armenian dancing. It's not. And in fact, it has absolutely nothing to do with the type. What you will see up here is a type of dancing that's indigenous to Armenians. Yes? What, what is that you know, the dumbag is not an Armenian drum, although you will see it used by Armenian bands, for instance, in different groups. Uh, Dumbag is uh, basically an Arabic drum. In fact, it's, I think its origin comes from Persia. Uh, it's uh, not quite as versatile a drum as this particular one here, because it can only, you can only get certain sounds out of it. Now, <coughs> in the recording you just heard, did you hear a drum being played in there? That was this particular drum being played, where I use certain Armenian instruments within the orchestra. Uh, I also made a recording in Beirut where I used the duduks and the shri and the uh, Armenian drum, the double, with a symphony orchestra. And uh, I don't know if that record is available right now, but you have it, two notes that are played together at the same time. So here you have a basis, a pedal point. It's another word for it. A pedal point is the word that you're looking for, probably. Uh, and uh, on top of that, the melody is played, which gives you a, a harmonic basis. Because otherwise, if you have no pedal point, the harmonic basis may vary depending on how different people perceive that same note. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, I was wondering, uh, when you played the musical scale, and you distinguished what was Armenian, would you call the second one? The Armenian? Yeah. Well, what augmented you? second. The well, augmented well, second, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Could you write down in other words, what does it look like note-wise? Is it what they call the seventh? Well, it's a, it's it's a, it's an interval. For instance, in an interval, an interval from B flat to C sharp is an augmented second, and uh, let's see, and it's three half steps, basically a step and a half. 
All of the other uh, step uh, scale motions are either half steps or whole steps. In uh, this particular, in the minor scale, you have a step and a half. Now, uh, in, in Baroque music, it's very interesting if you uh, know anything about that, or some of you who are in music. Uh, they avoid this by going around it, going up the scale. You see, what they do is, instead of going this way, they do this. Now, as they go, uh, let me show you a little bit. If this is the Here is the black key that's B flat to C sharp. They come up here, instead of going to this black key and jumping over here, they come up here, they go to this one, to the white key, to the B, jump up to the C sharp, come to the D, and then play backwards and go to the B flat. They make a crisscross, which they turn to be the melodic minor scale. Which, uh, technically, that's what it is, the melodic minor scale, which I think is just a way of avoiding the augmented second. And precisely, that scale was developed just to avoid that. Because, uh, like I said, it's very interesting to find that in any of Baroque music, you will never find that particular interval. Is the augmented second okay, but it's peculiarly Armenian? No, no. Uh, uh, that augmented is used for, uh, it goes into quite a detailed thing to explain it, but it's where it's used that makes it more Armenian than anything else. At the end of the scale, for instance, there's a Russian augmented second too. Now, they use it at the beginning of the scale. The augmented second is used because if you go into modes, I don't want to get too technical, but if you go into modes, uh, the different modes have this. For instance, the augmented second will wind up at a different place, and more indigenous to Armenians, where this mode is used as a leading tone. Right. Well, it doesn't necessarily have to be B flat to C sharp, but I'm saying if you uh, the end with, it's, it's at the end of the scale. And that makes it more Armenianish than anything else. You see, I don't want to go back a thousand years in history and say that you know find somebody else has been using it, but so far as yeah. that I can figure out. Uh, Is any Armenian music in major key? Oh yes, there are some, very few, but there are some. <laughs> you know, uh, any other questions? But some people say Armenian music is sad because it is in a minor key or in a mode. What, do you have any comments about that? Uh, yeah, there's a certain sadness to a minor key, and there's a certain happiness to a major key. Not necessarily that that's what the uh, what it is, because we have so many gay, beautiful, vivid dances that are all in a minor key. There's a touch of sadness to it. Uh, I think that's also a condition. I think that's perceived in the same way. Let me, let me give you... You know, using harmony in music, uh, psychologically, you see, can give you so many different things. It's, it's like the grammar of music, harmony. Uh, let me give you an example here quickly. Let's take a sentence. John loves Mary, right? And let's assign it to three notes. So many different things with by uh, expressions by use of harmony. For instance, if you want to make an exclamation, John loves Mary, a definite statement, use a major chord. See, it doesn't want to do anything but state it. It doesn't go anywhere, it doesn't feel sad or happy, does it? Right? Now, 
Now, if you want to make it a question, you can use, for instance, a dominant seventh chord and uh, make it a question. John, John. Why'd you say John? John love. You can't just let it hang there. See, same three notes. I'm not changing the three notes. John love. John love. You have to answer, right? Yes. Or John love. <laughs> Which makes it minor and makes it sad. It's negative. You see? Or you can make it even derogatory if you don't really want to, you know. Uh, for instance, uh, put a diminished chord into it. Yeah, you don't have to answer that one. You can do that way. But, like I say, you can use all of these different things. Harmony just by use of that. Composers use that all the time. So. He sits there and he says, now, what is, John loves Mary. Should we make it definite? Should we make it sad? Should we make it happy? Should we make it a question? You can do all of that by harmony, you see. And, of course, there are many other means. Any other questions? Did you have a question? Yes, was the recording that we heard from the Pastor Ina uh, concert recently? No. Uh, was the recording that you heard was the same piece that was played at the Pastor Ina concert. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't that particular concert. Is that recording out there? Yes, uh, I have some here. Oh, the Pasadena one? That's the same recording. It's the same piece. In other words, the same orchestra recorded. We had it recorded for that concert. Who arranged that uh, piece? I did. Um, uh, are there any questions? Because I want to get to the film so you can take a look at it. Now, again, I warn you, it's not, you know, perfectly Hollywood, this film, but... Uh, it does give you an idea. Now, can I have a book or something to prop under here? Oh, wait. I'll, I'll try this. Uh, well, I, I can use these, probably.
We have to stop uh, in the middle of this, and uh, because we want to continue, we have more treats for you here. We want to continue with a live performance now. We have a young lady that's going to dance for us, and she's right here. So uh, we're going to let me move this back. Yeah, it's too bad that this was in uh, film. It's in yeah, I mean, we're, we're lucky we have this. this. Yeah. And we're lucky we have this. But it was the uh, most exquisite, I think, dance. Where was it? Uh, this is at the Shrine, I think. Shrine of Earth. Yeah. yeah. But you have to make their dresses were just too uh, fast. Uh, 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 they're yeah. for sale at my store. <laughs> 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 Bobby, is it my outfit? Yeah. Different. There are different, oh. all kinds of different yeah. materials. Do you have one here with you? or? You know, I, I have to apologize because I went to the cleaners to Yesterday, and they can't find it. Oh. Oh. You're kidding. No. So. <laughs> so. I have to make another one, so this is what I'm doing. So. Right. <laughs> uh, but anyway, Denise, the reason I would mean, shoot, you know, I'm glad he brought this film because it fits right into questions oh you're asking. And, <laughs> yeah, that, that's, I mean, tell us more about your costume because part of it when she had her costume on, she was telling us about how she made it, mix it all the pieces. Too, which you can still improvise. But uh, um, she was the first person, which I heard just recently, that has been, you know, she's taken upon her own to learn about the dance and to describe really the uh, historical, uh, well, the, the Armenian dance. And uh, she's gone to Armenia. And so she's really, I mean, taken upon herself to do a study of the Armenian dance along with the costume, etc. And uh, um, and you, we will see you, right? Okay. And so you will see the movements that you saw up there. And you have to, I think for us as an Armenian, to, where I've seen this dance all the time, and maybe a year or two ago, I was at the uh, Wilshire Ebel, and they had Armenian dance along with a lot of other ethnic groups. And then, you know, I've heard in the back, but I heard somebody say, hey, that's a bit boring. It wasn't the belly dance. Right? They were expecting the belly dance. And, you know, I thought, well, that's our fault because we're not telling people what the Armenian dance is. And so, the, you know, and then shortly after, you know, when I, you hear the explanation, if you have a background to it, then you understand and appreciate it more. So, Denise Manudian, uh, what did you just show? Uh, Denise Manudian, what Yeah, there is a pop for big dance groups over there. This is one of the uh, better ones, and this is also more progressive. Some of these dances that look uh, authentic are really not. They're, they're kind of, the, uh, they go on to. But this one that we cut at, which is going to be a comical dance, we're going to look at it later if you want to say what, uh, that is an authentic one. So when did you get to uh, actually in the saber dance? Uh, oh, my man. Oh. It didn't look like that. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. But she had a great figure. <laughs> <laughs> Speak to your back to me. What's you just saw again? Pardon? Speak to your back to me. Person that's about over 60 in it? No, he's 
about 80. Um, and every now and then at a wedding or a picnic, someone will just pop up in front of you and they be made really old and they can't walk, but you can see that movement. You can see the feel in their heart. You can see when they move their hand, they just place it exactly where they want to go and they don't do anything else. It's very slow, it's very simple, but it comes from within the person, from what they're feeling at the time. Um, the dances are done for either a joyous occasion, a wedding, uh, a celebration of some type. It's not a type of dance like a swing might be here, where you just went someplace and decided to dance, or a group of people got together and decided to dance. That really wasn't typical in Armenia. People got together for some type of family gathering. The first dance that I'm going to do for you today is called Zahke Punch. It is uh, a dance of springtime, a dance of the flowers opening. It's usually done by a group of women representing the flowers. of the movement, of, of this moment where the flowers are opening, of this up and down, which is just, um, I don't know, it's really just a feeling, this is supposed to just be a feeling of nature and a feeling of it about to happen. And then this is just the prettiness and the feeling of what spring is about. Women did this in the springtime. I have heard that they went not house to house, but within their family, family to family. And like Debbie had said, that's a hearing. I don't know if it's true. I can't say how long ago they did it. But that's just one of the different reasons that I've heard that the dance was done. Um, I learned this dance from a man by the name of Ruben Hovanesian. Uh, he studied in Egypt, maybe? No, he studied in Armenia. And he um, is the only person to do that, this particular dance in this styling. Every other person that I have seen do it do it completely different and do it in a way that is influenced by Persians. Which just says that either that grouping of people was closer to Persia or they moved to Persia or some, something happened.
to change that dance from what it was 100 years ago to the way it is currently being done now. The things that you saw in the film are not dances that are currently done now. Those are dances that are being replicated from something that's long ago past. Um, now in this country, we are just as Armenians beginning to see the need to try to keep those pieces done the way they were without the influences of so many other peoples. Because of what has happened to our peoples, we're spread all over the world now. And we have a lot of those influences. We have Persian influence and Greek influence and Egyptian and the uh, Armenians in Jerusalem and in Lebanon and in France and America. And so you see all these little changes. And the most important thing is to try and save it as it was because it is now something of the past. And the only way that people here can do that is by learning it, by seeing it, by passing it on, and by understanding what the culture was and, and how it should be preserved as that. That is done. It's a dance that's um, done by a woman, usually done before she's gotten married, but it's not a bridal dance. It's something that's saying, I am now changing from a girl to a woman. And what she replicates in the dance are, are things of that she would be doing in her life. Um, the parts where she's going by her eyes is 
is putting on, not of makeup, but of beautifying herself as a woman, as now um, the wife of someone. Because she's now representing not only her family, but she's representing the family of the man that she's marrying. Um, the parts where I was down, going forward and back, is all parts of preparing the meal, of rolling, of sarma, of, did you talk about food at all? <laughs> okay, of making the bread, which was a very, very important aspect. Um, I'm really sorry that I couldn't wear a costume because part of the feel, even as a dancer, part of the feel is when you feel the weight of 20 extra pounds of costume on you. But we will be doing a concert at the Wilshire Bell, um, where we will be doing an Armenian suite of dances, men and women, and other Middle Eastern material, Persian, Iranian, um, Azerbaijani, and Georgian. And if you come to our concert, you'll be able to see it in full costume with the full orchestra. It will be May the 18th on Sunday afternoon. How do you see how your hand is? Are mine? Well, well as far as I mean, yeah. Um, do other people have it? Oh, you mean other countries? Sure. Other countries, but they're a little bit different. Mine could be, okay, I can't say that my hand movements are exactly our meaning because I've never had the opportunity to study from someone who also learned purely our meaning. Um, and they are also influenced by, I do Persian dance, so I have a little bit of Persian style, whether I like it or not. Well, what we saw in the film, which is another word. Yeah. It, 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 it's typical around the area. Okay, the, what I have learned is that Georgian women are much straighter. They, do, they aren't as soft. They are just as graceful in walking as they try to keep their shoulders level. But if their hands hang, and they show much more of a strength in whatever they do than an Armenian woman who might do that, who might be more graceful. Only because it's showing a strength. A woman, is con a woman can be stronger in Georgia than a woman in Armenia can. Um, Azerbaijani women are up more and bounce a little bit more. So the hand movement, this type of a movement is basically the same. It's what you do with the rest of your body that goes along with that. In Azerbaijan, they might do a little bit more of a hip thing, a little bit more. It's just